Okay. I'm brilliant. All right. So I guess you can only hear me now. Um, all right. Well, this is my talk. I'm talking about uh, artificial life. I've been doing artificial life research, uh, actually spending most of my time doing artificial life research for about the past uh, six months now, maybe, maybe a little more than that. And I'm going to show you just uh, uh, some, some things about artificial life in general and, and the particular project I've been working on, uh, trying to evolve actual artificial intelligence using principles from artificial life. So there's me. You can email me if you'd like. So first question. What is life? Well, one answer could be hydrocarbon chains, something that reproduces. Not, not a bad answer. Most biologists will tell you something like that. Information processing. Computer science will probably taste something more like that. Something that squishes when you step on it. This is actually a surprisingly robust definition. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, we'll have to, there's some flaws in that one. But in general, if you look in the dictionary, you know, there is no general consensus, consensus on what life is. So, what is artificial life then? Artificial life is life as it is now and, at, and as it could be. So, uh, artificial life in, in encompasses all of biology and more. So, we can, we can imagine many types, of, many types of life that could have evolved, evolved here or somewhere else, and, uh, and this encompasses all that we study. So, uh, more, like, state more directly, artificial life is what would, what would be called theoretical biology. It is biology of what is and theoretical biology, which, which could be or could happen here or some other planet. Um, you know, we can make it any other substrate. Uh, it, is, it is artifactual, not, you know, not fake. So this, is, this, this may be just a, a technicality for most of you, but, but, but people get really hung up about it. They say, oh, artificial life, oh, it's artificial, obviously it's fake. No, it's one of the general theses uh, of artificial life is, is, that, is, that, is that there's nothing intrinsically special uh, 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 about us that makes us different. And um, this, this is a contrast from traditional AI techniques. If, if, you, if you go to MIT and you study, study AI there, you'll learn lots about LISP and lots about Scheme, and you'll design lots of little sub-modules, and then you'll gradually build them up into nothing. So, and, 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 and we've been doing that for about 30 years. <laughs> Yes. Um, so, 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 but artificial life tries to do a, a complementary approach. Um, there is this notion called a bottom-up uh, synthesis rather, rather than top-down. What this basically means is that you define some really simple elementary primitives, and then you just and then you run simulations and see what you get out of it. And and then depending on the results, you change your primitives in some slight way. Um, this is not explicit designing and making tons of modules and subsystems. You just design the really, really simple pieces, and you, and you run simulations and see, it and see what emerges out of them. And yes, part of emergence and evolution. So, uh, well then, what does, it mean to be, what does it mean for life to be artificial? And this is from the father of artificial intelligence, Chris Langton. So... The artificial and artificial life refers to the component parts, not the emergent processes. If the parts, meaning the initial things you specify, are done correctly, uh, the life is genuine, every bit as genuine as, as you and me. So the, the big claim is that the primitives carrying out uh, the functionals of biomolecules and natural living systems support a process that is alive in exactly the same way that we are alive. Artificial life is genuine life. It will simply be made of different stuff than the stuff that has evolved from here on Earth. So um, here, here's, here, here's, some, here's, some, here's some artificial, here's some, um, this one I think has been going on for a while. So I'm going to show you some simple ones that, that, that I thought were kind of cute. So, oh, um, so this is uh, Ross Ashby. Um, he, he, he was one of the founders of the, of the cybernetics movement, if any of you know about that. Um, they're, they're, they're actually, in the 50s, there were a lot of great books written, written like this. Um, and usually all their designs for the brain are, like, are like com completely ridiculous. But if you want like, like a nice trip through memory lane, it's, it's, it's really nice. It, it, it gives you, a, it gives you a, a, a lot of humility about your own aspirations. So um, Roth Ashby, he, 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 said that w he said the defining property of life is, is, that, is that it was a system that could, remain that could be stable, uh, despite a changing environment. And this was like the key important thing. And he made, 
a very simple system that, would, that, that was stable to, to any changes in the environment. He called it the homeostat. And basically it was just a little, well, here I'm going to show you a picture real quick. Here we go. So we can see here it has, uh, see, four magnets here, and they pivot. And basically, and the, uh, and the, and the charge between them is, is what we're looking at. And so here, actually, do I have internet? Probably not. Okay. Well, I'll show it to you afterward. Anyway, suffice to say, there's a cute little Java applet, and you can, and you can like, and you can move and contort these things any way you want to. And, and because of feedback, there's only one, one stable position. It doesn't matter how much you torment it, how much you torture it. Uh, eventually, it'll always get back to the, to, the, to the same steady state and stay there. More artificial life. This is a cellular automaton. Most of you are probably familiar with this. This was the first self-reproducing self machine. It was developed by John Neumann while he was at Los Alamos Laboratories. And uh, John Neumann, uh, among his many accomplishments, in the later part of his life, uh, so self-reproduction was really his, his, primar his primary thing. Uh, he, he at, at that time, they were still discussing whether or not self-reproduction inside of... because it would have to contain a representation. That repre representation of itself would have to contain another representation of itself, and further and further and so on, at a mentinium. Thus, machines... Um, a, a, a cute little parallel, if you, if, if you look at like or, or, or early myths of, of, of how a human reproduction works, uh, they have exactly the same thing. It's like every little sperm contains you know, a, a tiny little child, and every side of that little child is another sperm that contains another tiny little child, and this was considered a perfectly fine thing. So uh, they're, they're, they're clearly, this is this apparently is a very common state of thinking throughout the millennia. Um, but anyway, uh, John, John Neumann, uh, uh, he, he, he proved them wrong, uh, not, only, not only by showing theory, but actually making one. And he designed an extremely complicated cellular automata that can make copies of itself. Oh, uh, actually, I should probably explain this. Um, for those of you who don't know, a cellular automata, well, okay, it, it, it's kind of the game of life. And basically, like where you have like different cells are on a grid and they interact, and the activity of one cell is influenced by all of its neighboring cells. And there are various there, there are various flavors you, you can do on this, but that's the same basic idea. Um, so yeah, so yeah, so so John Neumann developed the first uh, self-reproducing machine in, in form cellular automata. And uh, oh, interesting point. Um, Neumann he he initially thought that. Uh, like looking at the bi biological world, he thought something of this kind of complexity would be required to have sufficient self-reproduction. And these days, we've, we've come up with much, much simpler systems um, uh, that, that are able to, to reproduce themselves. So, oh, yes, Con Conway's Game of Life, another ver version of, of cellular automata. So, yeah, you all know about that. Okay, now some more to modern artificial life. Uh, most uh, m modern artificial life basically comes something called agent-based models. They're used all over the place, especially in social sciences. Um, the the, the d defining quality of these artificial life models is that, is that again, I see on the picture, they, they, they have a grid, and the activity of a, and the activity one stays influenced by its neighbors. And, and, um, and it requires, like, yeah. And, and this is primarily useful, like, for economics. You say, oh, you know, like, if you're, if you're, if you're around rich people, you're also likely to be rich, or... Um, or ecological resources. Oh well, we'll define, you know, a uh, harvested plant and non-harvested plant, and then we'll and say, oh, if you're near other harvested things, um, you don't grow, and if you're near unharvested things, you do grow. And you can and you can generate surprisingly accurate models of all these things. Um, disease propagation. This is something, something that, uh, that's, that's particularly cute. It's been informed by network theory lately. So um, there, there, there's a new thing that that uh, if you're going to be uh, inoculated for for, for STDs or something like that, very frequently they'll ask you for uh, for one of your friends, and and and, and basically uh, s s statistically, um, statistically one of your friends is more likely to be a, a, a central node than you are. So so thus so thus so thus if you inoculate everyone's friends instead of themselves, you'll, you'll actually you actually do better in containing many diseases, and this is true for for many types, um, cytodynamics, cosmology, yeah, etc. Um, robotics, yeah, this is uh, this, this has definitely gotten the most light lately. Um, this is a really great picture with uh, with Rodney Brooks and Cog here. That's one of my favorites. Um, uh, Cog here actually is pretty interesting. Um, he he actually goes goes qu uh, quite a bit against the mainline uh, MIT artificial. Oh, 
mainland MIT artificial mantra. Gesture at this. Oh, you're right. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, uh, cost conditioning, like basically each, each little individual subsystem is evolved. So like for example, to, to, mo to move the arm and picking up weights, uh, it was not ex explicitly programmed. You know, they said, hey, here, here, here are your mo movements of freedom, just try and lift it. And, and, and we'll see how you do. And they did, it, and they did, a, did an algorithm where it, would, where it would just improve itself. And, that's, and so, so, so COG, COG, COG is largely a, uh, a, a summation of a whole bunch of little tiny systems like that. And Cindy Brazil and Kismet. This is this has been done ad, ad nauseum in, in the media. But basically, Kismet is, is, is a really cute thing. It looks at you and it stares at you and it makes cute faces. And it's supposed to make you feel warm and fuzzy. And will make yeah, it makes you warm and fuzzy. If you don't have friends. Yeah, if you don't have friends, that's what you get. Your 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 uh, your future sex bots look something like that. Um. Yes. Well, I don't. I don't know. Like, 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 Cog doesn't really try to be an engineering. Pro Cog is an engineering project. It doesn't try to be a model of anything. Like, they just want something that works. And as a result, they use a lot of things that most, that many biologists or even I would use. Anyway, so uh, a very a very central tenet in all artificial life is evolution. Now, this is a very, very uh, hot button subject these days. And so I don't know. I, I can hopefully do a brief example that will hopefully convince any skeptics about evolution. Um, so simply put, evolution is an algorithm. I, I think something that's, that's um, you can say many things about Darwin, but I think one thing that's very underlooked about him is that I think he was probably one of the first scientists to truly understand the idea of an algorithm, um, an idea that you can have a process implemented in, in any substrate and it works. So basically for evolution to work, you only need three things. Uh, you need a variable population, selection, and, and reproduction with some errors. Uh, with that, you get evolution. It, it doesn't matter what it's in. It can be it can be in animals, humans, computer code, water. I mean, it galaxies. I mean, anything you want, it works. So, so here again, to convince perhaps some of you skeptics of evolution, um, there, may, there may be a few of you. Um, I'll show you a, a nice little toy problem I came up with. Um, so uh, this, is, this is all done in Python code. The, 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 the code is about a page and a half long if you want to look at it. Um, we're going to try and use uh, evolution to find uh, perfect squares from 0 to 100. So here we go. Perfect squares. N no trickery here. Um, it was a sample. OK, so we're going to, start, 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 so we're going to use the, the, the Python ran, uh, random number generator and generate 25 random in integers. And then we're going to start making copies of each number. Uh, the, uh, the, the 20 random in integers will, will be our variable population, and start making copies will be our selection. And basically, the closer a number is to a least square, the, uh, the more likely it is to reproduce. So, um, so this should be pretty clear. So, like say, so let's say your, your number was 5. So, it'd be, so your chance of reproducing would be 0.2 times 1.5. Now, um, if, if you're a skeptic here, don't let this bother you. Um, this, this basically is, is this basically makes anything survive. Like for example, um, if unless you're like directly on it, your likelihood of producing is going to be below one. So basically, this prevents just everything except from the absolute best from dying out. So like I assure you, there's no trickery here. Um, oh, and of course, then when copying, there's half a chance to add or subtract uh, one for one for our number. So again, pretty simple. So. Here, Oh um, yeah, so he, so this is this is our this is our fitness function for those of you who who know. What, oh, this is crap. Hmm. Well, suffice to say, you can see each each uh, each each perfect square over here, and you can see a grad and you can see the the likelihood of, of reproducing dipping down as you get further away from them. So here's 81 here, 100 here, 64 here, etc. <laughs> Yeah, you can see it, all right. It, uh, I'll, 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 I'll put slides on that if you really want them. Okay, so, so, so here's some results. So, we're, so he, here are 25 who random integers. Um, and that, you know, that looks about random. There are a few, there are a few, few uh, duplicates, but nothing, nothing too unusual. So here we go. So, uh, so this is after doing, doing the procedure I just described once. After doing it once, we can already see that, uh, a, that the vast majority of things think the vast majority of numbers we had have immediately died out. And so, so we've already gotten a good bit of pruning already. I'm going to do this a couple more times. 
so here we go. Uh, at, by time step four, we can see we, we know we see some clustering at uh, at zero and one, near nine, uh, 64, and almost near 81. Oh, and we also got 100 too. How can I miss that one? So here we go. Um, by time step six, it looks even more like the distribution we'd expect. And by time step eight, even more. So we can so by time step eight, we can see uh, let's see one, four, nine. Let's see, let's see, 36, 25, 81, and 100. Oh, and 64. Yeah, that's too. <laughs> so here we go. Um, I, I, I decided to arbitrarily stop, stop it at, at after after the tenth cycle. And by this, we can very clearly see that the only perfect square that is not found is 49. And I don't know, mm, nothing's perfect. Keep, keep in mind that what we see here, this is precisely the order from K, the order. Um, order from chaos using a completely blind and stupid algorithm that creationists say is impossible. Um, I mean, it, it really isn't. I mean, as as difficult as, as as it is to believe, this actually is the case. Um, as one thing, hmm? sure. Okay. Okay. Yes, yes, you will. I mean, I don't know. I, 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 yeah, I chose all these numbers because they're simple numbers you can do them in your head. Um, you know, and, yeah. I mean, I try to make it as simple as, simple as it possibly could be. Um, one thing, actually, I'd like to make, make one more remark here. I, I one time saw like, a creationist pamphlet, and it said something like, um, ha, 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 how can you, um, has there ever, has there, has there ever been a, pa has there ever been a painting without a painter? Has there ever been a car without a mechanic? Has there ever, you know, a bunch of things like that? And I must admit, there are extremely strong intuitions we have about design. And I must admit, like, like I, I share these as well. I have an initial gut reaction about it. Um, and the correct answer to this is simply that this is completely true, except when we get to evolution. And this is, and this is really what blew people's minds, that you could get this kind of design for free fr from blind processes. And it, and it blew everyone's mind 100 years ago, and it still is. So there you go. We can compare them. Pretty different. Yeah, evolution isn't perfect. We already discovered that. Um, yeah, we um, yeah, evolution is just, is, I mean, a lot of people like to say evolution is like this huge cosmic force that does like amazing things. No, uh, evolution is, is, is just an optimization algorithm. It's, it, it's, it's a pretty good one, and it's really impressive considering it's implemented in all biology, but it's not perfect. And yeah, so so here's here's some core issues. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting is that like if you if you evolved to one point, like you, got, you went from here, then not, then you evolved to over here, like in gene space, um, it, you discover oh wait, this is actually a terrible place to be. It's a terrible dead end. Um, you you can't go back. Like you're already over here. So uh, this uh, this is a this is a real problem with all genetic algorithms. And again, for actual organisms, um, if you do have random mutations like core functions, you know like you know, metabolism and things like that, you know, you're just screwed. I, it's actually kind of interesting. Um, in the, I recall in like the Human Genome Project and other similar projects, the way they would try to identify the genes for vital functions, they would, they, would, uh, they would run many, many generations and they would see the genes that have mutated the least. And, and basically, like mutation rate is not constant. The, the, the more vital a gene is for your survival, the lower the mutation rate is. So this, uh, well, that's that. So, what can you do with evolution and artificial life? No, I actually mean the mutation rate. No. No, 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 no. I, I mean, I, no, I actually mean the mutation rate is actually lower. Like, I, I, like I actually mean that uh, that uh, biochemically there there are areas in which if there are errors made, it, it, it checks over them very strongly and, and it will correct them. So I mean I, I don't I don't know we well we have to discuss that later. I I actually I actually do do, do not know uh, some, some 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 biochemist who is smart and I trust told me this. So, so I mean, it, it, it's possible I could be wrong, but um, but I don't think so. But but if you like really think so, we'll talk about it. Yes, yes, that that's that would be the theory. Yes. So, okay, look at evolution. 
You can do lots of shit with evolution. You can modify basically anything with it. And that's that. Um, use the so, so, so fuzzy problems. Um, this actually has been, actually, it's actually been used, by the way. Um, it worked, apparently. Uh, uh, oh, is it Sans actually? Um, apparently, this, um, oh, what was it? It was something on, on, on like, on like, <laughs> bomber. Like, apparently, it has these very interesting flaps prints it from just flying out of control. And apparently, like, no engineer in the world knows how these flaps should move. Like, it's just so crazy. So they, so they ran an evolutionary algorithm to do it automatically. And, and even to this day, people that work on it, they're like, hey, we don't know. Like, you know, so, so like they, they ran it long enough simulation, and then they find some crazy test pilot that's willing to try it. And, and then if it doesn't crash, it's like, hey, it lo looks okay. So, yeah. Um, yeah, obviously. Um, computer virus. Actually, this looks to be really interesting. I'm really looking forward to doing evolving code. Like, I mean, uh, some people have tried it, but, um, and, and there is polymorphism, but, you know, I, I have yet to see uh, computer viruses pick up truly novel functionality from, from evolution, and, well, not that I'm recommending it, but, 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 I, but it, it would really make my day if someone did that. So, yeah. Um, here's something kind of interesting. This is Carl Sims. Uh, he, he, does he does genetically inspired art. So what he does is, and um, what you have here, they're like these little panels, like these little foot panels, and you have different screens. So you say, oh, okay, I like this picture, and that picture, and that picture, and you like stomp on them, you stomp on the other one. And then when you do that, it says, oh, it'll mate them all together and give you new pictures. And then you do it again as, until, you, until you're done with it. And you generate these really nice stuff. Um, and a lot of them are really varied, and some of them are really like, quite striking. Oh, um, by the way, uh, Carl Sims, he, 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 he now works in the, uh, he, now, he now does special effects for, for sci-fi movies. So if any of you are interested in doing this kind of thing, uh, you can go work for him. Um, I choose something else that Carl also did. Um, this is some, something he did when, when he was at uh, Danny Hillis' uh, Thinking Machines Corporation. Um, these names may be familiar to a few of you. Um, this, is, this is kind of interesting. Um, he, he evolved creature types. So basically he had a graph um, of nodes and edges, and each, each node specifies a, a kind of part, and each edge specifies a, a type of connection. Um, these actually are really counterintuitive. Like, if, if you look at it carefully, this actually does equal that. You have to kind of think about it for a little while. Um, you know, how, how we can sort of, sort, of, sort of architecture, um, I, mean, I would like to know. But anyway, um, so basically, uh, the initial population in this case is a, is a it's, uh, gra nodes and edges, and it's the ability to perform some task, like it, it has uh, this critter in, in, in some sort of ecosystem where it tries to do something, and the reproduction mutation, it, uh, it'll occasionally randomly grasp things on, or it will like change the node type or connection type. And so I'm actually using the stuff with that. Let's do this. So we can see here, uh, this, this, this is the area for, for, for like a viscous fluid, and their objective was just to move, you know, as much as they possibly could. And so uh, we, we, we can see, see some things that, that have like, uh, that look defi definitely Earth-like, and, and others that, that don't at all. So, here let's... Occasionally you'll see like really broken solutions, those are my favorite. So here you go. So here's walking. Yeah, I like stuff like that. <laughs> so like everything has a piece of momentum and it kind of, kind of shift itself forward. And its, and its whole objective is to find some way to like just push itself forward. It doesn't matter how. Yeah, so we can see this one. This is where a block got grafted onto it. Yeah, I like that one too. That one's also good. Okay, that one, it's calculated by its center of mass. So just by the center of mass moves, it counts as, uh, counts as evolutionary. So. Uh, I, yeah, I think it's RMS. I mean, I don't know. I, I can't, I can't touch off the top of my head. 
I know. I, I got the paper for this if you want it. But I can't recall the detail. So just get as high as they possibly That's a good one. <laughs> now, this one's really nice. Look at this one. See, now, it can't quite get it, so it has to kind of turn around and get there. Like, like this is obviously a very partial solution, but it, worked, it works enough. Now, this one's kind of interesting. It has, like, like these little motor things. Um, yeah, I know, and then just the other way, a very interesting solution you wouldn't think of. Now, look at this. See, see now, it, it, it overshoots a little. So... All right, so that's, this includes the basic artificial life portion. We're talking about uh, evolving true artificial intelligence. So, as before, <laughs> intelligence. Well, um, but we think of reason, as many philosophers will tell you. Not bad. The ability to acquire and use knowledge. Uh, psychologists probably say something like that. Okay, now psychologists will really say that. Um, that's a T score, yeah, that's, that's what educators tell us. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, that's what we like to think. But basically, none of us really know what intelligence is either. Oh, well. But, let's try, but there's, there's another, another related question since, um, that, we, that we can get a better handle on. And that is, what is mind? Well, there has been lots of answers to this question. The Greeks thought it was marionettes of like lots of connections of strings. And uh, clearly, these connections of strings uh, you know, is, what, is what represents the mind because like, they connect so beautifully. Um, oh. Descartes, another brilliant thinker, was like, oh, clearly it, mim it mimics the plumbing system. Because, you know, like, you know, these little water, and it moves around, it goes in little chambers. That clearly must be the structure of the mind. Um, pulleys and gears, that's a revolution. Telephone switching. This was, this was really popular. You, you actually still find uh, a bunch of people saying something kind of like that. Um, especially, in the, especially in the old stuff, like the old artificial life. Um, yeah. And then we have, uh, so the modern AI movement comes from that. Yeah, good luck. Um, yeah, same thing. Um, but, you know, it's a good thing to know. I just want to tell you, we, we, we finally found the answer to this question. You want to know what it is? Neural networks within brains. Yep, so, so, so we, can all, uh, we can all go home and know we solved this mind, this mind thing. <laughs> Woo! All right. So, uh, now we know about brains. I'm gonna, now, so, we're going to look at brains first, and we're going to try and evolve uh, things that have brain-like properties. Um, this is actually a really nice one. Um, what this guy basically did, he, he, he took a monkey and, well, actually, I, I should step up, step back. Uh, when you see something, uh, it, it goes through your eyes, goes to an area of the brain called V1. And when you hear something, uh, it, it goes, it goes you know, through your ears into an area called A1. V1 for visual, A1 for auditory. Pretty simple here. Okay. Um, what this guy did, he, he, he took... Um, monkeys, at, monkeys after just having been born, and he and, and he and he cut out their V1 and redirected their visual stimulus to A1. And so here's what we can see here. So here we go. Here's the normal connect connectivity, and here's the modified connectivity. So, damn, these suck. Okay. Well, anyway. Um, well, basically, what you're supposed to see here is is, is that the V1 and the re and the and the rewired A1, uh, rewired as in like he just hooks it up and see what happens. Um, they look extremely similar in their graphs. So here we go. So here is and their um, and their brain maps. So you can see those are, those are pretty similar. And actually, here I got another one. Yeah, and we have another one showing compared to normal A1. So here's the here's a map of normal V1. Uh, this is normal A1. And this is the A1 of, of the rewired monkey. Now, uh, we can see it isn't quite perfect. But we can, and we can see it still retains you know, a little bit of A1-ness. But by and large, it looks far more like V1 than it does A1. Not only does it look that way, but it performs the, the vast majority of the same functions. So um, basically what this is telling us is that, is, is, is that uh, at, least for, at least initially, our, our, our brains are, are um, they're in, they're in a very infantile state, and they are rewired to suit their environment. So uh, what we're going to show here is a, is a connection between real and artificial brain maps. So um, this is also from the visual cortex. Um, we, we usually have to use, use vision because it's probably one of the most understood areas of the brain. 
And um, yeah, you can look that up, Monkey Cortex. This actually is a really fascinating work um, by Ralph Linsker at, at, at IBM uh, T.J. Watson Center. And basically what he did was he implemented uh, a, uh, he, he used, used heavy learning, which is one of the uh, neural learning mechanisms in the brain. And uh, using completely random inputs, uh, he, got, he got a very similar patchy coherency uh, for, for visual stimuli. So that's that. So um, yeah, actually this is saying the same thing. Um, this is from uh, Gerald Elvin. He, 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 won the, he, won the, he won the Nobel Prize a while ago. So he's pretty smart. Um, but, but basically here, uh, uh, he, this, I think this is from cats, I think. But basically, uh, this, is, this, is in, 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 in this is showing an initial wiring. And this is, and this is showing uh, a, a wiring um, maybe like, like in two or three years later. So basically, you can see that, it's, that it has spontaneously formed these different, you know, patchy coherence. So uh, the recap of all the neuroscience. Um, Telic based in brains. These brain functions are created by a general purpose learning mechanism. Um, basically, this um, we take it to be heavy learning. Uh, heavy learning is currently the only known learning mechanism in the brain. Um, well, actually, in, in the cortex. There's, no, there's, no, there's nothing called anti heavy learning, but, but that doesn't matter, really. Uh, and a pseudo, a pseudo initial architecture. So basically, the idea is that is, is, is that when you're born or any other sophisticated creature is born, um, it it, ha it has like some basic properties. You say, oh, okay, there should be something like a module here, something like something here, something like something somewhere else. But it doesn't really have any details specified um, because, quite frankly, the the brain the the connections of the brain are far too diverse uh, to be specified genetically. And uh, and would they just have a general general purpose learning algorithm that that prunes these th that prunes these basic areas as needed. So and we can yeah artificial systems capture key features of biological neural networks, and we can make artificial neural systems with um, this is a simulated heavy learning and evolving initial initial neural neural architecture. Um, don't let this box pretty standard. Um, actually, actually 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 this is better than standard normally. Most people would cheat on that one. Um, actually, no, I actually might explain heavy learning to you real quick. Um, this actually is, um, this was discovered in like the 1950s. Basically, the only known learning, learning mechanism in the, in the brain right now is that, is that if you have a, a, a one neuron and another neuron, and they both fire at, at approximately the same time, the connection between them becomes stronger. That's it. So, um, so, so, so basically, basically we, we, we have correlated activations. And uh, I, I think heavy learning is one of the key, uh, key examples of, of emergence. So like from this very simple rule, it does not seem like you could get very much from it. Uh, like it seems like you just have like things just dominate the whole system very quickly. Um, but basically, if you, uh, if, if you wire them up in sensible ways initially, you actually get, get some, very, some, some very, very neat behaviors, um, such as clustering and the patchy coherence I showed you previously. But anyway, okay, so. Um, basically, with this, uh, with this in mind, I present to you Polyworld. So, what Polyworld is? An electronic primordial soup experiment. So, uh, we're, 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 we're taking some of these things and we're seeing what we get out. Um, artificial intelligence, the way natural intelligence emerged. So, we are trying to evolve uh, uh, st stimulated nervous systems in, inside an artificial world. Um, working with both the intelligence spectrum. So basically, we're starting with the intelligence of about amoebas, and we hope to get to intelligence of maybe a cat in a couple years. Well, maybe 10 years. <laughs> and we'll be very happy if we get that. Um, and a tool for evolutionary biology. Yeah, duh. Okay. So, how it is not? Fully open ended. Okay, um, th th there, are a few thing there are a few things hard specified, but, um, but, but in. It's, it's, it's not quite that bad, but suffice to say, like you can't simulate absolutely everything. This is basically made for sim. This basically made, made. This is simulation made for evolving brains in, inside of an environment, and it's not really an accurate model of especially anything, but it's reasonable. And uh, it's not a particular model of any particular ecology, though you could do it, and a model of any particular brain, though you could do it. Um, but it, but uh, but we've been relatively reasonable. Like we've, we've taken a lot of biological inspirations, and I'm going to great lengths into, into describing them for you if you'd like me to uh, later. So, apply word overview. Um, every, every single organism has a genetic structure, and they evolve. They have physiology, metabolism. They have neural network brains. So. Um, just as we, as we said before, uh, every, every single critter ha uh, has a genetically specified initial basic architecture. So I might say, hey, I have a neuronal group here, and it has approximately these many connections to this other group here. 
and another group here, and like, and, and it'll tell you like the relative amount of connections you'd have between them. However, it specifies no initial weights. The, the initial connections are all random. It only knows basically average properties, and it uses heavy learning to 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 prune these initial connections. And organs, oh. Um, so organisms see their environment through a, a one-dimensional vision, and it's, it, it, it's RGB, if you're wondering. And, oh, so something is, some, some people have leveled this occasionally. Um, uh, we don't cheat at all here. Some people, some people cheat in their evolutionary experiments, and they use, like, contorted fitness functions that basically solve it for them. Um, we use natural selection alone. So, so, so it, it, if something survives, it reproduces, and that's it. Like, no cheating. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so no. Well, actually, that's a your vision. Your vision is always two-dimensional. Your perception is three-dimensional. Hard, but th but perhaps. Um, they 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 they, they, they w it would it would it would be good if they have two eyes. They kind of just have one big eye, and it just sort of and it looks around. Um, but but they do they do have a way. They have a focus. Um, they can well. They have a little focus thing, and they can like narrow it or widen it accordingly. So, right, right. If, if they want to be really tricky, they could perhaps like like do it back and forth really quickly. But that's that's I'm not even sure if that would even work. But uh, anyway, um, no. Like I mean, currently, I have yet to see an obvious solution that 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 clearly gives into dimensional vision. It, it might have happened, but I, I have not. I, I haven't seen it quite yet. So, okay. So here, here here's a nice little demo. Is this just going to work? Here we go. So we can see the, uh, the green little things on the ground. This is food. And if they walk over it, they gain energy. And when they move or they attack another creature or mate, they lose energy. And the little brown things there are barriers that they cannot cross. And this is just to make things more interesting. Um, very frequently, if you make these big enough, you can, like with just small little um, inlets in between them, you'll have different kinds of populations. And this is used to kind of give an idea of like speciation. So like you'll have like a certain kind of crew over here it might be very violent, the ones over here might be very peaceful, but then when they interact, like fun things happen. So um, some of these things you can see is that, um, well, well, I have used these online. This isn't quite coming out perfectly. But basically, um, w there are a bunch of them r r running along the edges. That's usually one of the simplest behaviors you first see. Um, you actually will see a bunch of them zipping around, and they actually do search, search for food. So here, I'll tell you a little bit about the, about the model a little bit more. Um, basically, there are two types of genes, brain genes and body genes. Um, these, these, these are the body genes. Um, basically, genetically, we ha uh, there's a critter size, strength, maximum speed, mutation rate, lifespan, fraction of energy to offspring. We'll get to this in a second. This is interesting. And ID. Um, basically, uh, these, these three here, um, they are, they, they are in, in, in inverses of each other. So basically, if you're super big and super strong, you can't be very fast. And so this is basically just to see if you get two kinds of solutions. Like you might have one big uber predator, and you'll have like a bunch of really tiny swarmy things. Um, so that's kind of fun. Um, Actually, in energy generated offspring, like uh, this is um, you, in biology, you actually see many kinds of organisms. Some who rear their young very carefully and put lots of effort into them. And those that just say, "Oh well, I'll go pop out a hundred, you know, and, and we'll see what happens." So this is used so they can get this different kind of thing. Um, this ID, um, uh, this is so that critters can kind of distinguish things kind of like them to things not so much like them. So like. Um, well, a classic example, like, like if one critter is, very, oh, is brightly green, its child, its children are likely to be bright, bright, brightly green. And if another critter has low green, its children are likely to be low green. So this basically allows really bright green critters from identifying something kind of like them, something not kind of like them. And this basically used to implement something like kin selection. Um, we haven't seen it yet, but um, well, we'll see. It's, it, it's there. Uh, <laughs> yes, maybe, maybe, maybe race for us. We'll see. Um, so actually, I had something that was kind of interesting. I actually did see some mimicking, which was really nice. I saw one critter. It would, it would do the best it could to mimic itself to the color of food, and it would just sit there. Then when they came close, it would just go, oh, and just eat it. <laughs> so that, I, I thought it was really nice. But anyway, um, but, but it, it didn't, didn't actually work very well because, well, we'll get to that in a second. But Anyway, so to, to the b brain genes, if I, were, if I were Richard Dawkins, I'd call them breens, but I'm not quite so, uh, well, that's another story. Anyway, okay, so um, 
So some basic things. Um, th they can choose how many resources to devote to each part of their vision. So, for example, um, again, they perceive it in RGB. I'll tell, you <laughs> I'll tell you what red and blue are in a second. And they can choose, like, they basically choose which parts of the environment are more important, and they can devote resources accordingly. And, yeah, obviously. Yes. Okay. So, um, no. But, but, but we'll get there in a second. Um, ba basically, there is, um, they use energy for both moving, mating, and also for brain complexity. So, like, so, the, more, so the bigger their brains are, the more, uh, the more they're punished. And, th and this, initially this was not done, but basically you found that critters evolved like gigantically huge brains that 99% that did nothing. And this basically makes things computationally feasible. I mean, all of that, it makes sense. I mean, you know, you, you want parsimonious solutions. Um, okay, but again, like uh, this, this is basically the, ar the architecture for your uh, for your initial what would you call it um, brain 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 scaffolding like 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 your initial framework that you that you can then uh, prune and add things on top of. So here I'll tell you a little bit about the architecture real quick. Um, the architecture is it, they have different neuronal groups. Um, some of which are inhibitory, some of which are excitatory, some which are inhibitory. They are distinct. Um, many, many, again, this is something to raise a very frequent objection. Um, real neurons cannot be both excitatory and inhibitory at the same time. Like, this is like a core fact. And many neural network models, they allow that. So if you ever show a neural network model that does that, some, neuro some neuroscientists will raise their hand and say, but it doesn't work that way. So, ta-da, for all you neuroscientists in the room. So, um, so we have, uh, have one group, and we have other ones, and they connect to each other. So uh, excitatory can trigger excitatory or trigger inhibitory, and vice versa. And we can do this many times. Um, this, is, this is actually very common in the brain. Um, very frequently, you'll find a r r reciprocal connections. Um, this, is a, this is actually more the rule than the exception. Um, the, the, the reason for this is not entirely understood. Um, but, you know, it, it's a very common fact, and this is true for uh, polyworld critters as well. So we have lots of these. Um, genetically, we specify how many of these groups there are, and so, so they can decide, like, how big, like, how many groups they want and the relative connections between each one. So, like, genetically, it can specify, oh, I want lots of connections between these, but not between those. So, and their connections all, all, but all amongst each other. Okay, and then at the very, and then, then at the end we have uh, we have outputs, and these are and these are the, uh, the 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 basic behaviors. They can move, turn, eat, mate, fight, light, and focus. I, um, the most of those are pretty clear. The light and focus I'll get to in a second. But, but basically they have a little blinker on front of them, and they use it to like signal to each other. Um, I, um, I, we have not seen them seen them use this to any sort of constructive purpose yet, but we haven't quite analyzed it. I um, mean, the folks you've already specified, they can, you know, increase or decrease the range of their vision as, as needed. And we have some, some inputs. And our inputs are, are the RGB of their vision. And again, they can, they, they can choose how, mon, uh, how many connections to devote to each one, their current energy level, and just something random. Um, it's kind of surprising. Some of them actually like to use the random. Um, it, it was initially just put in there just to see, just to see if they'd like it. Um, and some of them actually, actually t make use of it. I, I, we're not really quite sure for what yet, but, but they, they, they do establish connections to it. So, mm. uh, oh, well, it's also very common to see um, uh, uh, the energy level often will have strong, strong connections to things, so that when the energy level gets very low, they might, they might do, some do some extremely different behavior, usually mating. So, like, very frequently you'll see, oh, when my energy level gets low, I'll connect to a whole bunch of these things, but it basically just means mate profusely. Um, so, so that you can do whatever I can <laughs> to survive. Yeah, well, I don't know. He, 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 humans are, aren't, aren't necessarily optimal. So, okay, metabolism. Okay, yeah, this is basically just answering a lot of uh, your previous questions. Um, in, in, in energy, like critters lose energy by moving around, eating, no, not from eating, but from like attacking and like in, in complex brains. And size drinks, real energy cost. So if you're like a big, huge elephant, you know, it takes you more energy to move than like a fly, obviously. And um, oh, an important thing is that, is that uh, the, of course, the bigger you are and the more strong, and the stronger you are, you know, the more easily you can kill other critters, obviously. And we submit to energy cost, feeding food or other organisms. Um, 
I, oh, should we do that? Um, so some, something we should mention is that uh, energy is replenished from eating food or, or other critters. Um, we initially had it where, uh, where one critter attacked another one, it would like, gradually deplete its energy. But, uh, but, 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 and then when it died, the, uh, the energy left over would be, would, would be the critter carcass it would eat. Now, now this was initially a real problem because like whenever one critter attacked another, there would by definition be zero energy at the end, so, it, so it, there was no carcass. So, so there's, now a, there's now a fairly distinct you know, current health energy and carcass energy, and the carcass energy is, is, is determined by your uh, size and strength and, and age and things like that. And um, yeah, so, so if you're bigger, you can hold more energy in you, and yes, health energy is thinking from carcass energy, you've got to have that. So. I'm going to show you some, some, some simple behaviors. So here's eating. Ta-da. So we had the little food pellet there. It walked over it, and it gradually shrunk. Um, simple enough. Killing and eating. OK. Now, some, some of you can see, um, John always, always wasn't in there, but basically, um, a, 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 critter's, a creature's gr uh, green color component is mapped to their ID. A red, a, a, a red color is mapped to their, to their current aggressive behavior, and a blue color is mapped to their mating behavior. So if a creature is like really evil and nasty, it'll like, turn bright red because it's expressing a fighting behavior. And if basically if you see red, like you know, oh, this is, this is not good. When you see that, that's pretty red. I mean, it looks all redder on my screen, but, but it's red. So, and also if you see another creature that's like really blue, it's like, oh, you know, hot time. So, oh, failure, let's see. Okay, so here we have one critter and chomp. So here, let's show, let's show this again. Um, this critter eats this one, and, and, and then after that, it uh, takes its carcass. So this there we go. So goes near it. Maybe. There we go. So eats it and then it eats its carcass. Mating. Now in this case they aren't they, they aren't terribly blue, but um, they, 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 ha they happen to mate anyway. So here we go. This actually was kind of interesting. Um, in this particular case, these two critters that came, they mated instantly, and then, they, and, then, and then because of the huge energy penalties of making a child, they both died very quickly soon afterward, and then the child then ate both their carcasses. <laughs> it happens, I know. <laughs> the, 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 the Greeks totally, would totally dig this. Yeah, I'll, I'll show it to you again. This actually is kind of, this is kind of interesting. Um, and again, it, 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 and it can, can, can say, tell some things to you about parenting. It can definitely shorten your life, apparently. Okay, so that's that. Um, and, and again, this, this, this also shows um, so there are times when a critter may not want to mate because, like again, of the extreme, extreme, en extreme energy penalties. So lighting is using its lighting behavior. So here we go. We can see it's light, it's bright now, and it turns dark. So turning dark. Okay. Um, the the lighting behavior is merely so that they could potentially signal to each other. So, like for example, if you saw like uh, if you saw like like, like like bright lights, you could s like this. This is just a hope that they might evolve some sort of signaling. Again, that hasn't been seen, but but you know it's it's good to keep it there. It might ha might, might happen. I mean, you got you got to give them room to grow. So. Uh, this is the first species to, that we saw emerge. This is the edge runners. What they do is, they, is that they, they, they run along the edge of the world like this, and they just keep on doing that forever. And they, but, but, but then after that, when once the energy gets low, they, 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 they stop, and they sort of wait for a little bit, and they wait for another edge runner to come along. And, 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 and they pop out some kids really, really quick, and then, and then those kids do the same thing. And, and, so, um, and actually, it, I, it, there's a little bit of food on the edge. You can get a little bit. And, and and not only that, you 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 can eat the carcasses of, of of other edge runners. So, I mean, you know, it's 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 simple, but not bad. Vi oh, um, dead, dead, dead. 
it um, establishing a time scale between poly world time steps and real world time is intractable. <laughs> but um, but I don't know. But but the mutation rate is, is is something genetically set. So like so if, if a low mutation ends up being good, it can get a low mutation rate. Ends up being once a high one, it, 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 it specifies genetically. If, if you wanted to, you could actually artificially design your own critter genome. And we have done that for, for a few, like particularly nasty critters. Um, pretty, pretty, pretty nice predators. And those are the most fun. Um, but, but anyway, to answer your question, you, you, both are reasonable. Um, they use both. So, okay. Oh, this is my favorites. Okay. Actually, no, I should, I think, pause that. Okay, good. All right. This was a bug. Now, one thing you'll any, talk to anyone about artificial life, anyone who's worked on artificial life, they will all have some great bug to tell you. Now, I, uh, I, remember, I remember in Carl Sam's paper, he talked about a fantastic bug. Okay, apparently there was a problem um, which, which, which to, to avoid collisions. Like uh, he detected if one critter collided with another. And, um, and, and, basi and basically he, had, he did like, they were like floating point, that's where they were. And basically, had, and basically the critters, um, it, okay, oh, what was it? Well, anyway, basically what happened was that if critters got within a certain distance of each other, uh, close enough for, for, for there to be, be, be floating point air noise, um, a, critter, a critter would be instantly teleported to the other side of the world as far as it could possibly go. And so, so what all the critters immediately evolved to do is that, is that they, would, they, they would start rubbing up right next to each other just right until it happened, and then they'd be instantly teleported, and thus it'd be extremely fit. So, and, 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 and this is my version of that. Okay, um, this was uh, fool foolish me. Um, I, when when critters had children, there 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 was no there was no subtraction of energy from the parent critter. Now, for your parents out there, this may can seem seem like really obvious to implement, but it wasn't obvious to me. So, and here's what happened. Um, basically, you had well, I'll show you what happened. Ba Basically, all the critters they started forming a little circle. They, 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 they made it, they had a little orgy going on, and then then, then they they'd all play, they'd all they all have sex. And they immediately then when their children came out, they'd immediately eat them, and so and, and and so this so this was a free source of energy because like they'd eat their carcass, and then and then after that they and after this species was extremely successful and immediately conquered over the entire world. So we can see them over here. They're all having their little orgy. And they immediately eat their children the second they come out. And 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 they just and their population exploded. It was uh, it was it was touching. <laughs> so, well, yeah. Here's 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 another version of that. Oh, so this video isn't quite as good. But anyway, there's a really blue mesh here, and and these are a lot more mate happy, and they also eat their children. Um, this is another case where they did something very similar. Oh, they're the edge runners. Will basically conquer the entire world. And not too, not too long. So, next. Okay, some evolved some evolved behaviors. Um, so here we go. Did you did you see that? Um, where when 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 one critter saw another, it sped towards it. In this in this particular case, it was blue to make it even better. So, so there we go. So basically, this is sh shows that, that that their vision is actually being used for something. attack. So here we go. We have, um, oh, this isn't quite as good. But anyway, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll see a red critter come down this way, and then one will, and one will turn around and run away from it. So that was the red one there, and that was the one that was running away. Here, I can show that to you again. It looks, um, okay. We're going to have, I think that's going to be the red one. Yeah, the red one comes down here. This one sees it, like, and it immediately run, turns and runs away. So flee from red things. Okay. Gazing and swarming. So uh, he, this is this is trying the uh, lo lots of tiny things versus lots of versus a few big things. And here we can see a, a not really quite ant colony, but a definitely a swarming behavior. And so here there, there's one here, one group here, and there's one group over there. And the spotlight should go to them. There it is. Okay. So, and there they are. They find the food. They sort of cluster around it. Um, and they, they actually seem to be following. 
we looked at them and they seem to be following an algorithm uh, kind of similar to the Boyd's algorithm, where basically they kind of follow people kind of close to them. And so basically if one, so, there's, so if one has an opinion towards food, you know, they all just sort of move that, they all kind of move that direction. Observations. Uh, we, uh, we, have, we have seen some new behaviors. So it's like for use of vision. So they actually are using their eyes. They, they, they run from dangerous things. They move towards food. And they can follow other critters. Uh, yes, so, uh, so from the basic things, I didn't show you any, show many of their brain structures, but basically that you can look at their brain maps and, they actually, and, uh, and you'll find many, many initial architecture specified. Um, common question I always get, but is it really alive? Um, for a farmer in Berlin, um, these people at, at Santa Fe Institute, they, base, they develop some of the initial, they develop some of the best definitions of artificial life, or of what is life. And they, they say life is a pattern in space-time rather than a specific material object. It, they, have, it, they have self reproduction. Uh, Polyroldians have information storage and self representation. They have a metabolism. And they have functional interactions with the environment, and most importantly, doing perturbations, uh, <laughs> and they evolve. So, um, really, it, 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 it's information that matters. Life is a pattern in space-time rather than a material object. Um, Schrodinger, a very famous man, uh, towards the later part of his life, he got, he got really interested in self-reproduction, and he wrote a great book called What is Life? And he basically described life as islands of negative entropy. Um, they, they're like machines that have found ways to decrease their own entropy while increasing it outside of them. Hmm? Okay. Um, yes, and this is the, the main thing of functionalism, saying it is the process, not what's implemented in it, that matters. And the information theory it is intelligent. Yes, not as good to quantify intelligence just yet. Um, but there actually are things to look at simpler cases of intelligence. And this is from cellular automata. And, and we'll look at Chris Langton's lambda parameter. Um, this is like, this is, I'm not going to do this justice at all. I'm just going to give you a brief flavor for this. But basically, um, there we have this cellular automata, and Chris Langton came, uh, developed a way to characterize an entire set of cellular automata with a single, with a single parameter that he called lambda. And we'll, we'll show you some of that. So. And again, I have the initial paper for this if you're interested in learning about lambda. Um, basically, uh, times a low, low lambda doubt very quickly. So it's a little bit higher. Uh, they, they reach some, some periodic structure. And they reach it pretty quickly. Uh, with a little bit higher, uh, some more complicated behavior emerges. So, like, for example, we get some, we get some, some longer transitions and, you know, we get uh, a little bit longer transients and longer periodic structures, structures appear. So here's 0.4 and 0.45, and they can't quite see it. Um, you know, the transients here is like what? Maybe about a thousand steps or something. And 5.0, um, two transients get significantly longer. So here, so, 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 so here before, it repeats, before it started repeating itself, it went about 12,000 time steps from there to there. And we can see uh, far more complicated branching behavior. So. Uh, dynamics may keep you settle into periodic structure, but in general, uh, they, they expand out and they have uh, more complicated properties. Once we get higher than that, the transient times begin to shorten, and dynamics become chaotic, and then oh, and, and, th and then completely random. So here we can see the quite short. Uh, we can actually see the structure actually decreasing a little bit, and here it's here. This is just chaotic dynamics, and that's basically a random number generator. Um, you can uh, you sh 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 Shannon entropy basically. And these? No. Um, and, and, and if um, I, I must admit, like like, like for um, for these, I don't think you have any trouble quanti quantifying. But for stuff like that, you just you just look you just you look at a whole bunch of those, and you just do visual inspection. I mean, ah. Well, anyway, I'll show you a whole bunch of them later. But 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 basically, like if you just visually inspect it. Like it just it, you you don't you don't see a structure, um, intuitive. I mean, not the best, but it's what you work. Well, it's what you work with. So quantifying complexity. Um, so this is what we found. Um, if you define complexity as the length of transients, eh, not bad. You basically find that it has some totes at 0.5. And for those of you who are interested in Wolfram classes, you get those too. So for those of you who take this kind of thing. 
um, Warframe Class 1, Class 2, Class 4, and Class 3. If you don't know what this is, don't worry about it. Um, so the real question, is there a lambda parameter for neural systems? Um, we don't know yet. We're working on it. Um, but I can show you some, uh, some, some raw data we do have. Well, okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to measure state and, com and compute complexity. Uh, we're going to look at, um, well, okay, here's something you can't call find intelligence. We look at states, compute complexity. Mm, these kind of states seem reasonable for looking at. And these are some basic information theory measures that, we, that also seem reasonable. Okay. Oh, crap. Okay. Well, anyway, here are some... <laughs> Well, anyway, okay, well, these are some raw data. Here's a random graph. Here's a brain map of a cat. Here's one of a polyworld critter. Not quite a cat. We're working on it. <laughs> so, future directions. Major state complexity, food types, senses, pure ecology, do stuff. Class conditioning, yeah, we'll do that too. Okay, source code. Released October 20, 2005. Hey, that's yesterday. What do you know? So, and you can download it all now. It runs on Mac and Linux on Qt. Um, I have demos. So I can show it to you afterward. It runs on the Mac. That's why I had to bring it. Um, so, there you go. Sorry, Billy. Any, anything else? Real quick. Oh, uh, okay, sure. Billy, while you're setting up, I'll, I'll yeah, show you. I'll show it to you briefly. Okay. Do do do. Push it way back. Clearly. Okay. Terminal. Yeah, my screen is crap. So. Does this stand? Hey, it stands. Here we go. Um, this, I'm currently running some forging simulations. Oh, shit. Mm. Oh, sorry. Let's see. Oh, what did I do wrong? Well, it works. And I'll, I'll have it running for you in a little bit. This was running when I left. But anyway, um, we're, anyway we're, kind of, we're currently running some, some forging simulations, which is probably what broke it. But, um, but yeah, no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll have it running. I'll have it all running tonight. And if you want to come see me, just come see, it, just come, come see me anytime. Any other questions? Actually, no, I can't show you this. I do have screenshots. There you go. Not, qu not quite as good, but... Turn it around. Oh. Duh. <laughs> all right. So, well, in this particular case... We're looking at uh, food foraging. So here we have a whole bunch of critters at the end and a, whole f and a few small ones here. And basically, we put food bands, like j food just appears on the edges. Okay, done. <laughs>